I, I'm so excited that I'm actually going to follow through on something I said. Um, we, uh, we're going to do this series called uh, The Wow of Worship, and uh, that's an acronym for Warrior, um, Oneness, and uh, Willingness for Worship itself. And then we'll, we're going to talk about that over the next three weeks. And so this morning I want to deal with the warrior part of worship and um, kind of related to what a proper um, biblical understanding of spiritual warfare looks like and why we would do that. So let's just pray and then we'll get into it. Holy Spirit, um, be here as always in and amongst us uh, that you would illuminate our minds, that you give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding to equip us to overcome uh, the evil one in our lives and the lies that are spoken into our minds that you would give us grace and peace in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is a very real and tangible reason why the Apostle Paul in all of his letters to the churches always started his statements with the phrase grace and peace to you in the name of our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. The majority of letters he ends is also the same salutation that he says, grace and peace. That he closes and begins in grace and peace. He bookends his message in grace and peace. Paul very clearly gives us the lens by which we should be reading his letters. The parts that we don't understand, that don't sound like grace and peace, those are the ones that we have to wrestle through and come to a proper Biblical hermeneutic. Now I'm going to use this word for hermeneutic often in the next three weeks. And what a hermeneutic is, is it's a it's a heavy Bible school word they use, but it simply means your interpretation grid. It is like instead of using the word lens, it's how you see the world or how you see scripture. And so at the refuge, what we are very conscious of and what we hope to be very consistent of is that we have a Jesus hermeneutic. And this is where a lot of mainstream, uh, well, let's, let's not call it mainstream. It's where a lot of what I believe the top scholarship in Christendom right now is starting to discover and learn, is that we must have a Jesus hermeneutic. Now what that means is that typically, and what, what, what I faced off in this debate, is that for a large part, the church does not have a Jesus hermeneutic, they believe in Jesus, but they have a holiness hermeneutic, or they have a justice hermeneutic, or they have a wrath hermeneutic, or they have a vengeance hermeneutic, or a, you need to be justified, or a salvation hermeneutic. So this is where you will say things, Greg Kokel didn't say it in the debate, but he has said it in other places, that the primary reason God created us was to obey his commandments. That was the primary reason. And the secondary reason is the soteriological reason, which is mean, it just means salvation. It's to teach other people that they need to obey God's commands as well. So the prime directive becomes obey God's commands. Second directive is get others to do the same thing. And this is obviously then leads us to the conclusion that if you don't do it, there's going to be some heavy consequences to pay. And so you will hear people that have that kind of hermeneutic over and over say when they encounter grace, but what about the justice of God? What about the wrath of God? What about sin? I believe it was somewhat of the, one of the questions that was asked me at the debate. So what do you think about sin then? What's, like, what's the point kind of of Jesus? Like if God just wants to reconcile everybody in the end, then what's the point? Uh, I think something was really telling said there as well, that Jesus lived to die. I want you to think about that for a minute. That, it, that is the absolute opposite of what we teach here. We believe that Jesus was born to live, not that he was born to die. If the only plan of Christ's coming was that he was going to die for our sins, then we should have just killed him in the manger. Somebody should have just got a big old knife out there and pop in the manger and end the whole thing, and 
and then Jesus would have died for all our sins, his blood would have been spilled, story over. The Gospels would have been short, right? We'd have the whole genealogy of Luke, and so-and-so, we've got so-and-so, you know, there's Mary, and his birth, and the angels, and the shepherds come to bear gifts, and some crazy maniac bursts out from the nativity scene, and just slaughters Jesus in the manger. Horrific story should have just happened if that hermeneutic is true. You also have a real problem when you start to see that Jesus actually spends 33 years doing stuff. Does that stuff matter at all, or do we just need to read the part where he dies and raises again? Because the bulk of what we have in those four Gospels don't talk about the death and resurrection. In fact, the resurrection part's super tiny. Like, it's in a few verses. The, the death part is actually in a few verses. The bulk of the truth that we have in the Gospels and everything that Paul is talking about is not found in the story of the crucifixion and resurrection. It is all that stuff in between. So we need to get acquainted with that stuff. That stuff needs to be the focus and, and how we live. So, when we come to the subject of worship, part of the problem that we have in the church, by and large, is that we go into worship with the wrong hermeneutic. And this is why the Bible talks about us worshiping God in spirit and in truth. If you're taking notes, that one's important. We want to worship God in spirit and in truth. So it begs this question, if we are to worship God in spirit and truth, then what is the truth? Imagine if you walked into a church one Sunday morning, you're visiting a church, and if you're visiting here, I'm really sorry, this is not what we believe, but let's say you're visiting a different church, and you walk in, and the worship leader gets up, and they start singing a song that sounds something like this. God, we thank you that you put up with us. God, we thank you that your great desire is to slaughter, slaughter, slaughter <laughs> us. But thanks be to Jesus who saved us, saved us, saved us from your wrath. Saved us from your wrath and eternal health. It's a really bad song. Speaking of bad lyrics, more bad songs. So, you can't, imagine if you walk in, you, you would have a, you'd go, wow, this is a very disturbing place. What I find fascinating is that most of Christendom believes that, but none of them are singing it. Because it makes for very crappy worship songs. No one wants to sing about what they're actually proclaiming to believe. I was saying this morning to um, my friends, the, the largest here, that, you know, in, in, in Reformed tradition churches, they, where they believe in, in double predestination, that God not only sends people to hell, but he creates people with the full intention of sending them there. That they don't have any free choice, only the elect get saved. Now, I think that's the most damnable doctrine you could possibly have. But there's a great section of Christianity that believes that, or versions of it. It's not a wonder that their proponent, their leader, John Calvin, who lived in the 1500s, sent the death, signed the death warrant of over 38 people and sent them to the state to be burned alive because they had a different doctrine than him. <coughs> It is said, in fact, that Hitler got most of his understanding from the teachings of John Calvin. I'm sure I'll get some feedback from, yes. from that one, but that is the truth. We can't prove that that's what motivated Hitler, but he lived near and around the area where Calvin had a lot of influence, and we believe that influence is spots. Well, why wouldn't it? If God's going to kill all the Jews anyways because of what they did to Jesus... If they're reprobate because they deny the Messiah, then why not just get rid of them? You can see how that logic starts to work together. The problem is, is when we start off with a hermeneutic that believes that God is angry, that God's holiness has been offended by our actions, it is pretty hard to come into worship because we all have one common problem. We are all sinners. And I can tell you as much as I want, 
that Jesus paved the way for you to be forgiven. But the problem is we all grew up learning that even though Jesus did that, you still have to obey the Ten Commandments. You still better live up to Jesus' standards. You better still do the things that Jesus did. You see, this is why Christians are running around with bracelets on. What would Jesus do? To be a constant reminder in their life of, I might not be doing the right thing. What would Jesus do? Oh, right, Jesus would be doing this. Therefore, I should do this, but I really want to do it. And I do it. The thing that I want to do, I do. And the thing that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Which Paul said, so Paul didn't have a bracelet. <laughs> So we are constantly stressed out, and then, oh my God, what if you forget your grace at all? Then you won't be reminded of what would Jesus do, and then you certainly aren't going to do the things Jesus do, because your father is probably the devil. And that's a tough life to live. It's very hard to live under the constant stress of what would Jesus do, what would Jesus do, what would Jesus do? And you know what? For those of us who have kind of ascended up the ladder of that thinking and have a more mature understanding, we come to the conclusion that... I don't have a clue what Jesus would do. I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you're just like, I don't even know what the right thing is to do. I don't even know what the Christian thing is to do in this situation. I don't know. And then that's even more stressful, because then how come I don't know the thing that Jesus would do? Maybe I don't know Jesus. Oh, no. Oh, no, I don't know Jesus. Maybe I'm a goat. <laughs> oh, what's did that come out? I, maybe I'm a goat. Maybe he's going to separate me and say, I didn't even know you. And then I get fire. Because goats belong in fire. You know, it's like the fire and the goats. And that's me because not only did I sin, I don't even know what Jesus would do. And oh, it's just stressful. And so we worship under great duress. I'm hoping to know. We, we sing songs, oh God, I love you with my whole heart. And I'm like, I don't know if I do. Because then the preacher gets up and says, how much money do you spend at Christmas? You have a God of materialism in your life. Right, right. I didn't send all my kids, all my money to orphans, so I don't love Jesus, because that's what Jesus would do. Jesus would live in a box, and he would give all his money to the poor, because isn't that what Jesus said to the rich young ruler? If you want to get saved, dude, you've got to sell everything and give it, and then, and only then, will you be saved. And the poor rich guy walks away going, I can't do that. And we all go, yeah, Jesus said that. And we preach that Jesus said that, and that makes for a great sermon where we're going to take an offering. <laughs> we take an offering, then we preach, and we take back an offering. Because you give more in the second offering. <laughs> statistically. Statistically. Because now you're worried you might not be saved. You see, it's a difficult hermeneutic to live by because we are constantly stressed out. And if that is our truth, then we worship with hesitation. We don't worship with wild abandon. We don't worship because we don't really know who God is. And let me suggest to you that that kind of God, a God who actually tells us to love our enemies and then decides to punish His for all eternity, is maybe not worthy of our worship. Uh, let, let me just say that again for the record. That a God who commands us to love our enemies and will send His to eternal hell is not worth your worship. Find a new God. He's not worth it. Because guess what? I forgive some of my enemies. In this life. And I'm still a sinner saved by grace. And somehow I find the wherewithal to do it. Now I believe it's because the Spirit of God does it through me. But somehow I find it in me to do it, and yet God will not be able to find it in himself to overlook the sins of mankind. I mean, how many of you, on a day-to-day -day basis, set out to intentionally sin? Yeah. <laughs> Zero. Sherry. We're all pray for Sherry after. She's been in that cast a long time. She's angry at God now. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. I would say you'd be hard-pressed to find people who don't know Jesus that are setting out every day to be bad people. I would say even the people we know who do bad things, like drug dealers, don't wake up every morning being proud of the fact 
that they destroy people's lives. I think what they do is they push that out of their mind and go, I need the cash. Yeah. Yeah. I've got my own kids I've got to feed, and I don't like that this is destroying people, but oh well, the world's a bad place. Like, you know, there's corporations destroying people's life, like Monsanto's not doing the kingdom work. So, so how bad are they? I, I'm, I'm no worse. And, and so what is that called? They, they have to justify their behavior because they know it's not right and they don't feel good about it. So to alleviate guilt, they justify their behavior. People who murder do it. Often men who are caught when they have raped somebody, they often will kill the victim that they've raped. And the reason is to hide their shame. They're not happy they've done it. They feel horrible, but they don't want anybody to find out. Because you wonder, why don't they just do what they do and leave the person alone? It's because the shame overcomes them, and they hate themselves. And often they will kill themselves as well, if not then later. You see, shame is indicative of the human race. It is all our common problem. We see it in the Garden of Eden. The minute Adam and Eve do what God told them not to do, what they are flooded with is shame, not rebellion. See, we fictitiously speak about the world as if they are in rebellion towards God, shaking their fist. And this is what came up in the debate. That mankind, by and large, is living in rebellion towards a holy God. I want you to each ask yourselves, how many people in your life have you met who will openly say to you, yes, I live a life in rebellion towards God. I hate God, I've read the Bible, and I purposely do everything that it says not to. I mean, some of you have, should have met a few people like that. How many of you have met at least ten people like that in your life? Five? Two? One? Wow. It's amazing that there are so few people that we have ever found in our life that would even talk such a way, and yet the church, by and large, has spoken as if that's the majority of people that's out there. And so if we believe that then we believe certain things about God, and I suggest again that that God's probably not worth our worship. He's probably not worth our affection. And even if we determine that he was, as many do, because many Christians are still worshiping with that hermeneutic, but what I suggest to you is that it's a veiled kind of worship. Because it's not a worship that is in spirit and in truth, because they don't have the truth. And God is looking for worshipers that will worship both in spirit and in truth. And there is something marvelous when you walk into a church that is grace-centric, therefore Jesus-centric, that the worship is much more alive. That it is much more responsive to God. You don't know what to do with yourself. And I'll tell you what, the people that walk with Jesus, that really get to know his heart, as David did. And see, David's the one that's saying... God, you didn't even desire the sacrifice of bulls and goats. It's not what you want. You want a broken, contrite heart before you. That's what you're really looking for. And David got that, and David's responsible for most of our psalms, where the singing and the worship all comes from. And he was a worship leader himself. He loved to worship. Now, he loved to worship because he found that God. That's the God he found. And as much as David found the truth of that, it led him to be a worshiper. So part of our problem at the, at the onset is it doesn't do well to get up in a group of people and tell them, come on, we need to sing more, we need to worship God more. We were at an unfortunate uh, Christian concert, uh, a few of us, several months ago, um, with a gentleman who's a well-known worship leader. He's got several CDs and stuff. And, and he was saying, you know, the problem with the church here, you know, everybody here is so kind of... You know, you're just, it's kind of dead, and we don't get really excited about God, and, and you know, we need to get more excited about God, like at a hockey game. You know, everybody at a hockey game jumps and cheers and, and gets all excited, and I don't see that excitement here. And so, come on, we're gonna, I'm going to make up a song, and we're going to sing, Our God, He shoots and scores, He shoots and scores. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And it was so awkward. Everybody's like, yeah, our God, He shoots and scores. And so, for a lot of Christians, 
and why a lot of people have left the church altogether, is that dichotomy between I'm trying to worship God, and yet inside I feel like he's mad at me, I'm a sinner, I'm condemned, I feel shame, I feel guilt, and no matter how much I come to church, I can't seem to shake it. In fact, every time I come to church, I seem to get worse. I seem to be just reminded of all the stuff I'm doing that, and so I'm trying to worship, and yet I feel like this, and some people get to the point where they're just like, you know what, I'd just rather not go. Yeah. I'd rather just stay home. Because at least I won't be reminded of who I already am. And so they get tired and they get exhausted and they quit. And you also feel like a hypocrite. Yes, absolutely. You feel like a hypocrite, not just to yourself, which is probably the worst, but to the people around you. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for the most part, this is what we carry into a time of worship. Because we're carrying it around all week long. Now, eventually, it passes back into the subconscious of the mind, so you're not even thinking about it anymore. The danger is, is that most of us aren't thinking about it anymore. But the fact is, it's already been grained in. It's already been grained in. I mean, I'm preaching grace, but I still live like a guilty person. I'm trying not to. I'm spending time with the Lord. I'm getting better. But those trenches, they're deep. They're deep that I dug. Because I've heard it thousands of times, thousands of times. We get asked the question, how many people have you led to the Lord this year? <laughs> Negative two. <laughs> I have some close friends, they watched my life and they're like, that's the Christians are like, I stole two out of the kingdom. There's angels up there scratching them out of their whole life, they were like almost dead. <laughs> Remember being under such duress, you'd hope for those quickie salvations. You know, not the long debate, the long answer. You were hoping to stumble upon a guy that was tons of seed already planted, tons of water where you could just go, Would you like to accept Jesus in my heart? Yes, I would. Awesome. Say, Dear Jesus, come in my heart. Dear Jesus, come in my heart. Awesome. One. Huh. I'm good for the year. You know, you hoped for those easy salvations. And that's why the pastors, they were the most unfair, because they got to do the altar call. You'd be bringing your friend to church, bringing your friend to church, bringing your friend to church, and then the pastor gets 50 people on his belt, and you're still at minus two. Not fair. You know, so most of us thought, I'm going to be a pastor, because then I can do altar calls, and I can, you know, get that crown I'm looking for. But we're under all this stress. And it's pretty hard to be free in worship when you're under constant stress of your own sin and what you're not doing for the Lord. And you try to work through that all week on top of what the devil is already dumping in your brain about how worthless of a Christian you are. And then you show up next Sunday and they do the sermon on the parable of the talents. God gives ten to some, five to others, and some schmucks get one. What are you doing with your nun? Jack nothing! You bury it in the ground and get nothing. And most of you are sitting here with spiritual gifts and you're doing nothing for God. When's the last time you sang in the choir? When's the last time you put money in the offering? Because that's a gift. And then when's the last time that you helped out at the church? When's the last time you helped in the nursery? And so we, tell, we dovetail that in to a sermon on volunteerism in the church that Sunday. Use your talents for God. Hallelujah.
so you decide to skip next week. <laughs> this is awesome. You, you muster up, the next week you come back to church, and the sermon's on being faithful to God. Some of you are skipping church. <laughs> Some of you aren't coming. Because other things are more important to you. You'd rather watch tennis than come to church. You'd rather watch that sports game. You're out shopping. You're falling to gods of materialism. No, most pastors don't say it like that. That's in a charismatic church. Now, if you go to an evangelical church, it's a little bit different. It sounds entirely different. Charismatics, we just say it straight into how it is. We just cut to the chase. We don't, we, we don't walk around the gospel. We just say it how it is. In an evangelical church, they're much, much kinder about it. Friends. <laughs> Dear friends. When we look in the story of Luke of how Jesus dealt with his followers, do we find that sometimes some of us will ignore the deeper things and set up idols in our life and not follow them and follow after those things instead of coming and worshiping the Lord on a Sunday? It's the same message. Even if I say it nicely that you're a loser, it's still the message that you're a loser. Whether someone goes, you're a loser, go, friend, you're the nicest kind of loser. It still makes you feel like a loser. It doesn't kind of matter how we say it. The fact is the message is exactly the same. Now, if you go to a Reformed church, they just tell you you're a predestined loser. So it's like no matter how we do it, we're getting the same message. It's either nice, it's mean, or you're predestined to be a loser and you don't have a chance. So all of that just leaves us in this major deficit that we come to worship. And we just go, i got nothing left in the tank. I don't even care about, I don't even know these songs. Because I'm certainly not doing church during the week. I'm avoiding this stuff during the week. I'm just doing this once a week to not go to hell. I'm just here to get my card stamped so I get the 10 free copies, and I hope to get a free one in the end. That's the only reason I'm here. And I, I'd suggest to you that's a great percentage of the church. They, and, and you know what? The problem is, is as some of those believers start to mature just a wee bit, just a wee tiny bit, and they start to discover the grace of God just a wee little bit, they go, hey, wait a minute. I don't need this. I don't need to come here. And they vacate. It's actually the mature believers that are quitting church, not the ones that are staying, which is a sad state of the church. The best ones have left. Except here, right? But <laughs> You know, it's, it's kind of... And, and it's why every time a new church pops up in Calgary, like a new evangelical church, there's like 300 people in two Sundays. Why? Because they just left the last one. And they're just moving around because they're looking and hoping for a different kind of message. They want to hear something new that doesn't make them feel horrible and still, it, it still honors Jesus. Because you go to the other side, there's lots of churches that are all full of grace and they don't even preach in Jesus. They don't even talk about Jesus. It's just... Going on up to the spirit of the sky. You know, it's, like, it's, just, it's just irrelevant. It's just this giant metaphor for oneness and goodness. And there's rainbows and no Jesus. Right? There's that too. And the Christians are like, well, I don't really want that. But I don't really want this. And I want it something else. 2 Corinthians 10 says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What does that mean? Let's talk about that for a minute. I love this passage of scripture because what it relies on is exactly what I'm saying. 2 Corinthians what? Sorry, 2 Corinthians 10, starting verse 3. It requires a base of knowing what the truth is. The truth that we often believe that we, we are communicating here at the refuge is saying over and over that God is not angry with you. 
He's not upset with you. He fully loves you as you love your own children. And if you don't have children and one day you will, you will understand what I mean. He loves you like his own children. He picked you when you were already screwed up. He picked us when we were a mess. He, he knew what he was getting into. He knew the full package. He's not shocked. He's not like, wow, you're, you, you, that surprised me. We will say stuff like, well, I did that, but it's just not like me. And the Lord goes, well, it's exactly like you. It's like, I'm not surprised by that. You don't have to hide it. Because his call to Adam and Eve is his call to us. Why are you hiding? And our response is because I'm naked and I'm ashamed. If we're really honest, I do this because I'm ashamed. I do this because I feel naked. I feel exposed around you. And God says, come here and I'll clothe you with my robe of righteousness, which is my son. And we don't have to talk about it anymore. The robe's going to change you. Look, it's already made you a hundred times better. Look at you. You look beautiful in that. And that's what the Lord sees. That is what the truth is. It doesn't matter where you're at today. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you're in the middle of doing, or what you're thinking about doing tomorrow. The robe will change you. The righteousness of God is what will change you. This is why people come to me, yeah, but man, I'm doing all these sins and I can't seem to stop. I said, then, then you need to begin to come and abide and worship at the Lord's feet. Because this is what's true. This is what he looks at you as. And as you spend time with him, your mind is going to change till you start believing that. And when you start believing the way he looks at you and what he believes about you, then your sins will go away. Because he's not counting them. And he's not concerned about them because he knows how powerful his grace is. I want you to imagine that if I, if I have my uh, kids at home when they were young, and, and if they had lit a little fire in the sink on some Kleenex or something, and they run out of the room screaming, oh no, I've lit a fire, I laugh. I go, it's okay, it's, it's in the sink. Probably don't do that on the carpet. <laughs> but in the sink, we're good. And I just run some water and put it out. You see, and, and, and that's kind of how God looks at things. When we set fire in our life because we do sinful things, it, he's, he's not panicking. He doesn't scream and call 911 and pull out the fire hose because he's a holy God and he's upset about fire. He just turns the tap on. Just, oh, yeah, it's good. We don't need 10,000 sermons on it. We just, I take care of this stuff. It's what I, it's, I specialize in this. This is what I do. So we don't need to hyper-focus on it. So part of the problem when we come to spiritual warfare and we come to worship is that we have no effect over the enemy in our life when he begins to attack our mind because we don't have faith in God at all. We have the complete wrong kind of faith with, which actually breeds death. Because we are so focused on our sin that when the enemy comes in to discourage us, half the time we don't even know it's the devil because we just think it's actually God. It's one of the biggest problems in the church is the enemy is constantly attacking people's minds, but they just think it's God talking to them. You really messed up there. You really failed there. You're never going to amount to anything. You screwed up because of your sin. This is what's going to happen to you, you know, because the wages of sin is death. And you constantly live out sin, and so the, the result of that is going to be death. And so you live in fear about it, and you think God's speaking to you. Hey, let, let, me, let me remind you something. The devil uses scripture. And he knows the book better than you. He did with Jesus. He quoted verses at Jesus. God usually won't come and speak to you quoting verses. He usually just comes and talks to you. He usually will come and put his arm around you. Look for that gentle voice. Look for how he comes gently. And as you learn to learn God in that way, and you learn to know what the truth is, you're going to think different when you come into worship. And one of the best ways, and what we'll expose over the next few weeks, is that as you begin to understand who God is, and you understand the wonder of who God is, you understand that He is wonderful, and that He is kind, and that He is gentle, and that He is patient, and that He is long-suffering, which means He will suffer through your garden for a very long time. 
You know, before God destroyed cities in the Old Testament, he would send them warnings 400 years before. He would warn them consistently over a period of 400 years before he would execute judgment. Now, the grace you have in your life is no one here is going to live to 400 years old. <laughs> so you've got a lot of time. Time is on your side to work through some of these things by abiding in him. And as you know him, that will change. Your, your desires change themselves. Okay, I've got three more minutes here. So when we start to understand what the truth is and how God looks at us and what he feels towards us, which is good, his intentions towards us are good and they are kind, then I stop walking in fleshly thinking about looking at my flesh, looking at where I stumble, looking at where I fall, looking how I don't measure up. I take my eyes off that. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, because we're flesh creatures, we do not war according to the flesh. I used to fight the devil that way. When he'd come to me and attack me and try to condemn me, I, I would say things like, yeah, but I only saw one movie this week. He's like, say, you, say lots of, you see lots of movies and you're filling your mind full of carnal things, and good Christians don't do that. They read their Bibles all the time. So my defense would be, but I only see one movie a week. That didn't work out very well. Like, I'm arguing in the flesh against the devil about how good my flesh is. Or the devil might come to you and say, you know, you're a real drunk. All you do is drink all the time. And you go, well, I only drink occasionally. Well, now, yeah, but it used to be once a week, and now it's five times a week. But I only have, like, two glasses. And he goes, yeah, but remember Thursday you had five? Yeah, I did say five. And we get into these arguments where we're fighting him about our goodness and about our good deeds, and about how we measure up to what he's bringing as his standard, because he's accusing us against the law. And the Bible says it's better just to quickly agree with your adversary and move along and believe in the goodness of God. You've got to stop wrestling things out in the flesh, because you've got to wrestle them out in the spirit. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of this world. But they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. When the devil is coming to you, he's trying to exalt the thoughts he's giving you above what God says about you. So when the enemy comes and says anything to you that is discouraging, that is demeaning, that is lessening, that makes you feel bad about yourself, that is not coming from the Lord. He's trying to get your mind to be lifted up. That's what it means to be exalted. He's trying to lift up your thoughts above the knowledge of truth. And the way you solve that is you worship. The way you begin to fight the enemy is you don't argue with him. You don't engage him. You just go, you're right. That's all you say to him. You're right. You're a failure. You're this. You're this. You're right, but thanks to God and my Savior, Jesus Christ, who triumphed over death and the curse of the law, He is where my victory is. He is my hope. He is my strength. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not on my own effort. Thank you, devil, very much for reminding me. I was thinking the other day, I was getting pretty good at this, but you've come along, and I just wanted to give you thanks as well as I'm thanking the Lord for reminding me that I can and He can Actually, if you just want to hang out here and say more of that to me, that would be wonderful because it would continue to encourage me to remember how lousy I am, how good God is, and how he redeemed me regardless of me. And I guarantee he's going to leave you alone because he's going to go find someone who doesn't know that. There's plenty of people out there who don't know that. He'll go bug someone else. And we don't feel like doing that, but sometimes you've got to make worship part of your week. I encourage you to get some good worship music, get on Google uh, Play, you can download whole worship set lists that play like a radio station. And you might not like it at first because it's not your style or whatever, but I'll tell you what you'll get used to is your mind being filled with the glory of God. Your mind being filled with what God thinks about you. Your mind being filled with His goodness and His kindness. I'm not saying you have to do it all the time, but to the degree you do it, it will lift you up and you will start thinking differently. 
And then as you begin to get free from that, the devil is not going to bug you anymore. And when he comes, it will be easy. Some people, you know, there's so many books written on Christian spiritual warfare. And the Bible has one verse, resist the devil and he'll flee. And I don't know how we got books out of that. There's a verse, we got books. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are spiritual for the pulling down of strongholds. And this verse says, and arguments. The devil wants to argue with you. He wants to get into a battle in your mind, and you have to shut it down by saying, get lost, what you're saying might be true, but I am Savior, so it doesn't matter. And he loves me just the way I am. And then you begin to thank God, begin to praise God. If you know worship songs, begin to worship the Lord. And as you begin to do that and see that separation between the enemy and you, you're going to overcome things like depression. You're going to overcome things like anxiety. You're going to overcome your worry. You're going to overcome your fear. You're going to overcome guilt. You're going to overcome shame. You aren't going to overcome those things by trying to be better. You can't do it. You will only pile on yourself. The only way you can overcome is knowing who God is and how much He loves you and how much He has cleansed you of all your unrighteousness. He has cleansed you of all your unrighteousness. And He has covered you in the righteousness of the Son, which is perfect. You can't upgrade perfect. You can't upgrade that. And as you begin to know that, it's going to lead you to deeper and deeper worship. And the deeper you go, the deeper you will feel that. And the deeper it will reinforce that in your life. And the more you're going to be a weapon against the devil, and that way you can be used in the kingdom of God. And when you see somebody else depressed and discouraged, you just go, hey, I can tell you're not worshiping yet. I can tell you're not worshiping in spirit and truth. You don't seem to know the truth about God yet. Here's the truth. This is the truth about God. And if you know that, and you begin to meditate on that, it's going to set you free. Because what is it that the Bible says sets you free? Great arguments, right? No, no. The truth has set you free. The truth set you free. And this is why God says, I want you to come to me and worship me in spirit and in truth. Because this is what will set you free. Freedom has already been purchased by Christ, but it is not automated. You must worship in spirit and truth to experience freedom. That's the only way you're going to get freedom, is to worship in spirit and truth. You don't have to worry about binding the devil. You don't have to worry about calling down the spiritual principalities and strongholds and yelling at scriptures and the air. You can sell your shofar and you put away your flags. You don't need to do all that. You just need to thank the Lord and worship Him for who He is. Amen? Amen. Part one. <laughs> okay, all right. Jesus, we thank you. Bless you for everything you've done and everything you're doing. Help us to learn to worship you in spirit and truth. Reinforce that in all of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.